We are on page 283 in third edition. And frankly, as we go through the next couple of sections, once you've learned the basic paradigm on how to set these problems up, they're just different applications of the same thing. As a matter of fact, you might even lose the distinction between the different sections of the book because in one section it'll be talking about given a certain amount of reactant producing product, then another section giving a certain amount of product, how much reactant do you need, and he breaks down each individual case to a different section. But frankly, now that we kind of have the visual shortcut little method that I taught you, um, it doesn't really matter anymore you know, what side the given is on and what side the asked for is on. As long as we work the method correctly, we're gonna end up with the right answer. And in a couple places, I'm gonna stop and just try to encourage you to remember that what we're using through the shortcut method is actually this c multiplier, this conversion multiplier. That when we have a ratio of two to one, we're actually talking two moles of this molecule for every one mole of another molecule. Okay, just to re remind you that it's not some random number pulled out of a hat. It actually, we've, it's actually the same thing we've done before. It's just a more, uh, a simpler and a more visual way of figuring out what that multiplier should be. So, let me go ahead and so the section relating products to reactants and chemical equations um, like I said up to this point we've had to work from a certain reactants and get the products and now we're gonna start working kind of the other way around given a certain amount of product that we want to make how much reactant do we need this is in all of these cases, I'm using exactly what's in the book. But for those of you that might have second edition, I've decided to go ahead and put the formulas up here on the board so if you look in your book and it doesn't match, you can get the right formula down in your book. Okay. So given this formula here, we've got ilamite, and there's the formula for it. Hydrochloric acid and chlorine gas react to produce iron three chloride and titanium dioxide and water. So this is our balanced reaction equation. And the question comes back and says, how many moles of each reactant would we need in order to make a certain amount of product? So if we look at this reaction equation right here, and I told you that I wanted to make two moles of iron three chloride, what would be the recipe for making two moles of iron three chloride? Pretty straightforward, right? It's right here on the board already. To make two moles of this product, I would need to combine two moles of this reactant and four moles of this reactant and one mole of this reactant because our recipe is built right into the stoichiometric coefficients. That is the recipe to make two moles of, in this case, iron three chloride. And in addition to the two moles of iron three chloride, I would also make some titanium dioxide and some water. As a matter of fact, two moles of titanium dioxide and two moles of water as well. So I'll get all the products. But in this case, I'm asking a question, if I wanted to make a certain amount of iron three chloride, how much would I need to make two? And it's already given for us. It's for example, having this re balanced reaction equation on the board, and let's say that it was, again, we'll go back to the cupcakes analogy, okay? Let's pretend this was a recipe to make one dozen cupcakes. And then the question is, how much of each ingredient do you need to make a dozen cupcakes? Well, that's the that's the recipe we have in front of us. It shows us if we want to make exactly what the recipe will make, we put in exactly what the recipe calls for. But now, adding to that our discussion of limiting reactants. If only one mole of hydrochloric acid was available, okay, so you go to your chemistry cabinet and you want to go ahead and make two moles of this iron three chloride, and you start to pull out your ingredients, and it's no different than going to your, to your refrigerator and cabinet and start pulling out ingredients for cupcakes and realizing I don't have enough eggs to make the full batch. Okay, well, how many can you make then? In this case, if you, you, you know you wanna make two moles of iron three chloride, but you go to the cabinet, and rather than finding four moles of hydrochloric acid, you only find one mole of hydrochloric acid. So how much could you make? I mean, how much of this iron three chloride could you actually produce? I know it says silver down there, I apologize for that. I was looking at another problem at the same time. If, how much of all of these products could we produce if we only had one mole of hydrochloric acid? We still have two moles 
of ilmenite, we still have one mole of chlorine, but we only have one mole of hydrochloric acid. How much product can we make? So think through the logic of this. On one of my ingredients, I only have one quarter of what I need, right? So unlike a cupcake batter, I'm only going to actually react according to the proportions in the recipe. If I only have one quarter of the hydrochloric acid, even if I put in all of the ilmenite and all of the chlorine, I only put in one quarter of this reactant, how much of my product is going to be produced? One quarter, correct. One quarter. If I only have a quarter of what I need, I'm only going to get a quarter of what I should get. I'm going to have leftover ilmenite, I'm going to have a leftover chlorine gas, and I'm going to use up all of the hydrochloric acid if I only had one mole. It calls for four, I only have one, so it's all going to be used up because I've got excess ilmenite and excess chlorine, and hydrochloric acid is my limiting reactant it's going to stop the reaction engine when it runs out. So if I were to put two and one and one, this guy would run out first. And when he runs out, ilmenite and chlorine are left waiting for some more hydrochloric acid to show up. And while they wait, one quarter of all this product would have been produced. We would have a half a mole of iron three chloride, a half a mole of titanium dioxide, and a half a mole of water. Because only one quarter of the full reaction actually ran. You can think about it the other way. If I find that I have got excess chlorine and I throw that extra chlorine into this reaction, how much product is going to be made? Well, now I've got excess hydrochloric acid, right? I've got more than I need. And I have exactly what I need of ilmenite and chlorine. So what am I going to produce? Am I going to produce less the same or more in product? The same, that's right. Because I've run out of something else. When I get to the full production, I'm going to run out of ilmenite, I'm going to run out of chlorine, I'm going to have extra hydrochloric acid left over. See the difference? I'm going to have extra left over, which means for this batch, I'm going to get the full batch, plus in my environment, wherever the reaction takes place, I'm going to have leftover hydrochloric acid still in there, waiting for more ilmenite and more chlorine to come along so they can react as well. So whatever your limiting reactant is, if you have a lesser number, in this case of hydrochloric acid, it's your limiting, and your reaction can only run according to that amount that's present. If you have excess, that means the other things are your limiting. We'll see a question about that in this where I had this mistype here where it says silver, it comes from that problem that we're going to talk about. So example 8.3, it says that a chemist wants to make, and on the recording I say ether, sometimes it says ether. Frankly, even though I look it up, sometimes it's different. So ether, ether, what ether? It's, you know, ether, ether. So a chemist wants to make, we'll, we'll call it ether today, how's that? I'll change. Wants to make ether for medical anesthetic. It's the stuff you, you know, knock people out, ether. So the chemist wants to make ether as an anesthetic, and he uses the following reaction. Two ethanol reacts with one sulfuric acid to produce one ether and one persulfuric acid. So these are the formulas up there, but rather than sitting here and saying, okay, we've got one C4H10O molecule, I'll just use the word ether, okay? So I use the common names underneath their chemical equations when we walk through the formula. So this is the formula. It says, if the chemist needs 134.9 moles of ether, what's the minimum number of moles of both ethanol and sulfuric acid that he needs. So how am I going to start to solve this problem? We've been given a balanced chemical equation. What a, according to the process that I've shown you, what are we going to write down next? Let's write down what we know first. What, what have we been given in the problem? We know that we have, in this case, we're going, we need to make 134.9 moles 
of ether. The problem tells us, and this is the part that's unique to this problem. Sometimes I get questions about, well, how does this number of moles come into the problem? I understood it to this point, I don't understand this point. Well, this point is the way it is in all of reality everywhere. This is what's actually happening in your lab, okay? So this is the formula everywhere, and in your lab, you're trying to make 134.9 moles of ether. And the question asks us in two different steps. It's for two different things. It asks us for how many moles of ethanol and how many moles of sulfuric acid. So in this case, obviously I've written up on the board that I want to solve for the sulfuric acid first. I have moles of ether that I want to produce. How many moles of sulfuric acid do I need to produce that many moles of ether? Okay, so first thing, write down what you've been asked to figure out, what's known that you're looking for or you've been given, and then what you've been asked for. Now, I did a little bit different on the PowerPoint slide than I did on the, with the box in the middle, but I think when you see it, it'll make sense based upon what, we, what we've already done. The next part is what Lexi was referring to, right? We're gonna do what is the relationship between these two, two things, what I've been given and what I've been asked for. I'm gonna go ahead and draw the arrow saying I'm moving from the given from my known to my unknown. My known is 134.9 moles of ether. That's what I'm trying to produce. So how much reactant do I need? In this case, how much sulfuric acid? And what is the relationship between moles of ether and moles of sulfuric acid in the perfect recipe, in the balanced reaction equation? What's their relationship? It's a one-to-one -one relationship, right? For every one mole of ether produced, it required one mole of sulfuric acid to be used. So write down my known, my unknown, their relationship. And here I'm showing again, it's a multiplier of one. Remember the technique is as you move in the direction of the arrow from your known to your unknown, whichever number you hit in the relationship first, that one goes below. So it's one over one or one, which means we need exactly the same number of moles. There are, we require 134.9 moles of sulfuric acid in order to produce 134.9 moles of ether. Because the balanced reaction equation shows us that there's a one-to-one -one relationship, the same number of moles, not the same number of grams, the same number of moles. Second part asks us to solve for the other reactant. We have 134.9 moles of ether that we're trying to produce. How many moles of the other reactant, in this case, ethanol, how many moles do we require? Same process, I'm going from my known to my unknown, and now I need to find out what is the relationship between those two molecules in this reaction equation. How do they, how do they relate to one another? Right, reading from left to right, it's two to one. For every two moles of ethanol used, I have the potential to produce one mole of ether, or another way to say it, for every mole of ether that I want to produce, I need to have two moles of ethanol in the reaction. So the relationship here between my moles of ether and my moles of ethanol is a two to one ratio, or two to one proportionality. So my multiplier here is by two, because again, I'm moving from right to left. As I hit that one, it gets knocked to the denominator, and my multiplier is two. Remember, what this is saying is that for every two moles of ethanol, it relates to one mole of ether. Then I do the math. My 134.9 1, times two will give me 269.8. So 269.8 moles of ethanol, okay? So what we've done here is we've gone from Whereas before we were given a certain amount of reactant and we were told, figure out how much product you can make. In this subsection, what we're doing is saying, I want to produce a certain amount of product. How much reactant do I need? Okay. So moving from here this way to this way, we would knock the first in the relationship down if we're moving from left to right. As we're moving from right to left, we knock the second one down. But in either case, it's the same process. See why I was saying it? If you understand that you can do this process on these equations, whether it's reactant or product really doesn't matter. 
And yesterday at the end of class, when we did the last On Your Own, one of your classmates came up after class and said, hey, I didn't do it exactly the same way you did. I know what we did is we related one reactant with a product and another reactant with a product. And what your classmate did was re related one reactant with a product and came up with a number of moles. And then based upon that number of moles, did an intermediate step. Now, that works, because remember, remember once, you solve for, once you have one piece of information, it'll help you solve for every other piece. Once you have a quantity needed for one, using the stoichiometric coefficients, you can compute this, the, uh, the moles needed for every other reactant or product. The problem is, if you were to make a mistake, let's say you were to use your number in that intermediate step, if you, if you wrote it down wrong, let's say even you got it right on your calculator, but you wrote it down wrong, you could potentially carry that error on to the next step. That's why if you try to stick with what's been given to you, in this case, I could have related moles of sulfuric acid to moles of ethanol and come up with the same answer. Because here I computed how many moles of sulfuric acid I needed. I could have said, well, for every mole of sulfuric acid, I need two moles of ethanol. That would have given me the same correct answer, but if for some reason I messed up my math here, it would mess up my answer here. But if I'm always just driving from something the book has given me, you know, stated in the problem, I'm less likely to carry over my own error to other steps. But if you get it right, it's true. Because you can see here, if we've, we've said that to make 134.9 moles of ether, we need 134.9 moles of sulfuric acid, this second part could be, okay, since I have 134.9 moles of sulfuric acid, and the relationship between sulfuric acid and ethanol is 2 to 1, I could multiply that by 2, and I'll get the same answer. Make sense? Okay. Now, you can, you can see here, if I messed up and just wrote like 130.9 there, and then I multiply that by 2, I 261.8, and it would be off, because I carried my own error over to the second step. Any questions then? Anything you've seen here that there's nothing radically different here? This is just working from right to left rather than working from left to right. No questions? On your own, 8.3. Citric acid, so over here, it's one of the products of this reaction. Go ahead and work this on your own and we'll follow up with the, with the work in a few moments. Citric acid, a component of fruit juices, drinks, jams, and jellies, it's produced by using the following reaction. C12H22O11, which is sucrose, plus water and oxygen, reacts to produce citric acid and water. If a fruit drink manufacturer decides that she needs 2.8 times 10 to the fifth moles of citric acid, what is the minimum amount of reactant of the reactants that she will need? Again, I'll write that on the number on the board in case you don't have it in your book. 2.8 times 10 to the fifth moles. We're trying to produce 2.8 times 10 to the fifth moles. How much sucrose, water, and oxygen do we need in order to make that much product Is the white letter on black background working for you on the slides? Okay. Whenever I use a white background with dark letters, you'd think it'd be better, but it actually sh gets so much shine back, bounce back, that it washes out everything. It's not nearly as clear, I don't believe. So kind of using the negative type here. So using this balanced reaction formula, trying to produce 2.8 times 10 to the fifth moles of citric acid, how many moles of sucrose, how many moles of water, and how many moles of oxygen do we need to provide for the reaction?
as we go through the answer, we're going to talk about sucrose, water, and then in oxygen. So if you could solve it in this order, solve for sucrose, then solve for water, then solve for oxygen, you can kind of flow along with the way I present the answer. Your setup for your first solution should look something like that. So for sucrose, we're trying to produce 2.8 times 10 to the fifth moles of citric acid. We're going to look back to one of our reactants, in this case sucrose. How many moles of sucrose do we need in order to make 2.8 moles of citric acid? We're not dealing with any of these. We're going to get numbers for these as well. But if I were putting together the perfect recipe, I'm not going to put any extra or too little. I want exactly the amount I need to have exactly that much. In other words, when I run this reaction, I don't want any reactants left over. I want everything to be product. Okay. So 2.8 times 10 to the fifth moles of citric acid relates to how many moles of sucrose? Moving in this direction, right? What's the relationship between my two molecules? One to two. And since I'm moving from right to left, my multiplier is one half. Not because I'm moving right to left, but because as I hit the one to two relationship, the two gets pushed into the denominator, so my multiplier is one half. So what is 2.8 times 10 to the fifth times one half? Right. We keep the same scientific notation, the same 10 to the fifth we need to be there, but we take half of our coefficient. So what this is saying, if I want to produce 2.8 times 10 to the fifth moles of citric acid, my perfect recipe is going to include 1.4 times 10 to the fifth moles of sucrose. The next reactant we need to solve for is water. What's the relationship between my moles of citric acid and my moles of water? Again, it's a one to two relationship. My multiplier is going to be one half, not two. It's going to be one half as I move from right to left. So I take the number of moles of citric acid, I multiply it by half, and my answer is just as before, 1.4 times 10 to the fifth moles of water. Now this third one is the only one that really provide, you need a little bit of process. It might have been a little confusing. It's a little different than um, you can't just look at it necessarily and it be obvious. Let's see what that looks like. So we're trying to solve for how many moles of oxygen do we need. Again, 2.8 times 10 to the fifth moles of citric acid. We're going to be moving from right to left to moles of oxygen. How do the, how do, in the perfect recipe, in the balanced reaction equation, what is the relationship between moles of citric acid and moles of oxygen? Three to two. Does everybody see this? The relationship is 3 to 2. You should see very clearly how 3 to 2, how I got that number. 3, 
I'm looking at moles of oxygen, and I try to keep it lined up as much as I can, considering how much information I have to put across here, but moles of oxygen relating to moles of citric acid. The three comes from the coefficient, three, and the two comes from the stoichiometric coefficient of two. They relate to each other in a three to two relationship. What it's telling me is for every three moles of oxygen gas, I can produce two moles of citric acid. I have the potential to produce two moles of citric acid, assuming that I've got sufficient of my other reactants as well. So the relationship here is a three to two relationship, a three to two relationship. And then as we're moving from right to left, we hit the two first, it goes into the denominator, and so our multiple is gonna be three halves, or a 1.5 multiple. We need one and a half times as much oxygen as we want to produce in citric acid. When we multiply 2.8 times 10 to the fifth by one and a half, it produces a result of 4.2 times 10 to the fifth moles of oxygen gas. Yes, ma'am. Then you're a dweeb. No. <laughs> you just wrote out, what, uh, 420,000? Okay. I would encourage you to stay with the form that they give you because you're, you're going you're gonna to run into issues with significant figures just by not, by not using the same notation. The reason they put it into scientific notation here is because of, of um, significant figures or possibly precision. But wh however you got that number in the first place, it was given to you as scientific notation for a reason beyond just it's shorter to write. Okay? So technically speaking, it's, it's, it's true but not technically fully correct. But so, so all three of those parts, 1.4 times 10 to the fifth sucrose, 1.4 times 10 to the fifth water, and 4.2 times 10 to the fifth oxygen. If we have that many moles of each of the reactants, what are we going to produce? If we have exactly those amounts, we're going to produce exactly 2.8 times 10 to the fifth moles of citric acid and how many moles of water are going to be left in the product side as well. Louder? No, I'm just asking. Just look at the board right now. Okay, if we produce 2.8 times 10 to the fifth moles of citric acid, we're also going to produce, correct, we're going to produce twice as much water as we do citric acid. So since this is 2.8 times 10 to the fifth, this now becomes 5.6 times 10 to the fifth. See, because if we know any one of them and we have a balanced equation, we can figure out all of them. We were asked to solve for this, but I could just as easily, easily have also asked you, and if we produce that much citric acid, how much water would we produce? In this case, the multiple would be two. Any obvious questions that you have on how to do this? Again, process is the same as we've done last class. It's just looking for different parts in the equation. In this case, given the amount that you want to produce, how much do you need to produce that much? Working from right to left rather than from left to right. And the only thing it really does in process is change which number here in your relationship goes to the denominator. Okay. Section 8.5, what I'm calling it, using chemical equations when the limiting reactant is identified. As I said before, this is going to be a case where you know what component, what portion of the balanced equation is limiting the reaction. Something's running out. And when that reactant runs out, it stops the reaction engine. So if you know what runs out, you know what's going to stop the reaction. And when that limiting agent or that limiting reactant stops the engine, you know how much is going to be used of the other reactants and you know how much is going to be produced in the end. So that's what we're going to deal with here in this section. Using chemical equations when the limiting reactant is identified. So we have silver 1 carbonate and hydrochloric acid. They are reacted together to produce silver chloride, water, and carbon dioxide. When I was your age, I actually was involved in using this reaction commercially, this reaction right here. Some of you remember I was raised near Rochester, New York, and my dad worked at Eastman Kodak Company. 
This was before digital photography. As a matter of fact, my dad was a production planner, and I remember him telling me uh, one day when news broke in the Rochester Democrat and Chronicle about digital photography. And my father explained to me um, how that even though digital photography was going to be a substantial part of the future photographic market, that there would always be a place for chemical photography. The chemical photography would not go away. Eastman Kodak made its money on chemical photography. And when I was your age, I was part of an explorer post, a chemical engineering explorer post at Eastman Kodak Company. And I was in this room where they had these huge vats of liquid. And see, what's important to know about chemical photography is the images on your film are actually produced by a reaction with silver. And when you take a picture, let's think of it in terms of black and white, you know, there's certain parts of the, of the actual photographic medium, the, the picture, where the silver attaches itself and stays, and it creates a certain tone. And there's certain parts of the picture where the silver is released and it doesn't stick. And that's what causes a different tone. And that's where you see the shading and things like that on a black and white picture. Let's just keep it that way for now. So, whenever Eastman Kodak would get your film back for processing, they would process that film. And what they were doing actually was washing away silver off of your film. That's why film is so expensive when you buy it because the, it's coated with a layer of silver. It's actually a silver molecule, but it's not pure silver, but silver is in there on the film. And so think about this. As Eastman Kodak sells you the film that has silver on the film, you take a photograph with that film, then you send them the film back to them, and their job now in development is to wash away some of the silver. Doesn't it make sense that they would want to try to capture that silver? Because if they don't capture it, what happens? They're just flushing silver down the drain. It doesn't make sense for a company to get the silver back that you paid for and then just throw it away if they can recover it. And this process is one of the steps in recovering that silver. These huge vats of liquid flowing through and at the end of it, there was a collection point and we would pull out silver. Silver that the customer had paid for in the film that they were expecting us to now wash down the drain. But why should we when we can capture it and either reuse it or have it as a, an, a resource? It's very valuable. So as you look at this reaction here, taking a silver molecule, silver, silver one carbonate, and reacting it with hydrochloric acid to produce a silver chloride with water and carbon dioxide, nobody's concerned about having water as a, react, as a product, right? Carbon dioxide, not concerned about that. But silver chloride, hey, if I can get silver chloride out and I can eventually separate the silver from the chlorine, guess what? I have silver. I have a, a, a you know, solid silver, and that has value. And so as a company, I want to capture as much of this as I can because over here, you look, hydrochloric acid is pretty cheap. It's very, very, very inexpensive. However, the silver carbonate is very expensive. So if we're coming together and we're going to have this reaction take place, and I'm trying to save the silver because it's so costly, right? What can you tell, you, tell me about how I want to set up this reaction? What do I want to make sure I've got plenty of in the reaction? Again, think in terms of Eastman Kodak. Let's say that this is what actually comes through the door. My silver two carbonate. Okay? That two should have been dropped down. Obviously, it dropped the formatting. But I think you can deal with that, right? Two, Ag2CO3, silver two. Silver one carbonate. If this is expensive and this is cheap and I'm trying to capture every single silver atom that I can, what am I going to make sure that I've got tons of in the reaction vat? The silver is coming to me. It's very expensive. But if I have hydrochloric acid, so here's the deal. If I have, we want to make silver one carbonate. We want to make this our limiting reactant. Why? We want to wring every single silver molecule we can out of the vat. And before we can wring it out of the vat, we got to get it to react with, with hydrochloric acid. Now, if I have one molecule of silver one carbonate and I've got two molecules of hydrochloric acid, it'll be a perfect match, right? It'll wring out. But you know what? When we measure out the number of moles and we use it in large quantities, it's an approximation. We know that. There's a possibility that I will have 
a little bit too little hydrochloric acid, in which case I'm going to flush some silver down the drain. And I want to make sure that I give every single silver atom in there the opportunity to combine with hydrochloric acid so that it can be flushed out. Because if it doesn't react, it just it doesn't get captured. We want to capture it. So to make sure that every single silver atom within this molecule has an opportunity to be wrung out of the mixture, I'm going to make sure I've got plenty of hydrochloric acid because it's cheap. I mean, I basically would not put this in water. I would just take hydrochloric acid, super concentrate it. I mean, if I have, in this case, you know, if, if I put two and one in, I'm kind of hoping it's close and I'm going to get most of them. But you know what? If I put one and one in, I know I'm flushing stuff down the drain. And if I put one and ten in, I've got five times more hydrochloric acid than I need. I'm, I'm increasing my odds. I'm betting that, you know what, before I flush this down the drain, it's going to react with some hydrochloric acid somewhere and drop out my solid silver chloride. See, it, it's a solid with an aqueous to produce a solid. That solid drops out and I can collect that solid. Okay? So what I'm going to do is make sure that if this reaction engine stops, it stops because I'm, I run out of the valuable thing. I want to make sure it's all squeezed out. So if it stops, it stops because I ran out of this. Not because I ran out of this, because this is cheap. I'm going to flood the, I'm going to flood the environment with as much of this stuff as I can to make sure I get every atom of this stuff. Okay? So the limiting reactant is the one you want to intentionally run out of. And when you run out of it, the reaction stops. In this case, we want this silver one carbonate to be the limiting reactant. We want to use up every single atom or every single molecule of that because we want every single atom of silver we can get. And we want to make hydrochloric acid our excess reactant. It's one of the definitions in the book, the excess reactant, okay? We want to have not only just enough, we want to have way more than enough. We don't ever want the reaction to stop because we've run out of hydrochloric acid. Because if we run out of hydrochloric acid, we could very well just be flushing the precious silver down the drain because there's nothing for it to react with. Here's an example of that in example 8.4 from the book. Example 8.4. Some ores contain a small amount of precious metals that are in compounds with many other elements. You see that here, this potassium argentoside. Argentocyanide? Okay, I had to look that one up. I didn't know it, okay? Some ores contain a small amount of precious metals that are in compounds with many other elements. For example, one common ore found in the earth is potassium argentoside. Since silver, see the silver in this molecule right there? Since silver is a precious metal, it's useful to be able to extract the silver from this ore. And it follows this reaction to do that. Two, potassium argentoside plus zinc reacts to produce two silver plus zinc cyanide plus potassium cyanide, okay? You want to get as much of this as you want, as you can get, and you want to stay well clear of the cyanides, okay? Because they'll kill you. So you kind of take your life, you know, into your own hands here. You're going to play with cyanide, but the benefit is you can get the silver. <laughs> Anyhow, this is the balanced reaction equation for us to take this molecule of potassium argentocyanide and wring out the silver. Right. Now, if a chemist adds 5.61 moles of potassium argentocyanide to excess zinc. Now, when I read a problem like this, I would, and I, this will be up on the board in a minute, but let's just capture this information now. It's 5.61 moles of potassium argentocyanide. And the problem says the chemist adds that many moles of potassium argentocyanide to excess zinc. Now, as a chemist, when you hear this, to excess zinc, what they're telling you is you got plenty. And what I do is I go through and write a plus sign and circle it above it. To me, that reminds me that, hey, you're not going to run out of zinc. You got plenty, plenty, plenty of zinc to run this reaction engine. So what they're telling you is in advance, they've already figured out how much it would require, and they've already given you more than enough. Okay. So again, the word problem says, 
this many moles of potassium argentocyanide in excess zinc, in other words, you're not gonna run out of zinc, this is going to be your limiting reactant. So the number here is gonna control how much is used and how much is produced all the way across. Okay. So if a chemist adds 5.61 moles of potassium argentocyanide to excess zinc, how much pure silver can be made? It should look very familiar here. Let me erase my scribble. 5.61 moles of potassium argentocyanide relates to how many moles of silver? Just like before, we're gonna look what is the relationship between the stoichiometric coefficients of potassium argentocyanide and silver? In this case, it is a two to two proportionality. They relate to each other two to two. Two to two. Okay? Two to two can be reduced down to one to one. But even if you don't do it that way, if we're moving from, in this case, left to right, we hit the first two, and our fraction would be two divided by two, which is equal to one. So what that means is we're gonna have the same number of moles produced as moles provided because we have plenty of zinc to make sure it keeps going. And I wanted you to remember that in this right here, this two to two relationship, what that means is, when we did our conversion uh, factors before, that two to two means there's two moles of silver for every two moles of potassium argenta cyanide. See that? That's what happens when you come across here and knock the moles of potassium argenta cyanide below the number of moles of silver. It produces that conversion equation, or excuse me, that conversion factor. So it's just like we did it before. Now we're just using the short visual shorthand to do it. And so since it's a one-to-one -one relationship, for every 5.61 moles of potassium argenta cyanide that we use, it's going to produce 5.61 moles of silver. Same, same. On your own, 8.4. Calcium chloride 6-hydrate that's this molecule over here, is a substance used to melt snow on streets and sidewalks. It's made from calcium carbonate, according to the following reaction, which is on the board right there. If 7.2 moles of hydrochloric acid if 7.2 moles of hydrochloric acid are added to excess calcium carbonate, means I'm not gonna run out, so don't worry about it. How many moles of calcium chloride 6-hydrate will be made? We only have a couple minutes, so go ahead and press on solving that one. For those of you that are done, just remember, just looking at it again, calcium carbonate, there's plenty of it. There's plenty of it present. And so we've kind of moved beyond trying to use the perfect recipe and get just the right amount of each reactant to produce exactly what the balanced reaction equation tells us we will produce. Now we're at the point of, okay, this is the perfect mix, but this is what we actually have. And this is what we actually have at both either the product side or the reactant side. So because of time, let me press on here with this. We'll go ahead and write this again. That we were given that we had 7.2 moles of hydrochloric acid. We're trying to find out how many moles of calcium chloride 6-hydrate we would be producing. It's a relationship of 2 to 1 
as we're moving from right to left. See, it's two hydrochloric acid to one calcium chloride tri six hydrate. Two to one means that we multiply it by a conversion factor of one half, and so we have 3.6 moles of calcium chloride six hydrate.